getting nervous about talking my session because I'm talking about neutron. And I should be talking about SDN, right? So, so I made a title a little bit catching with SDN without SDN. Everybody knows it here that we need to some software to setting or define network for the VM. And the reason why I add without SDN is that I don't, we don't use the open flow controller in our environment. So yeah, everybody using that. OK, let's start it. Well, I'm coming from Dam Kakao again. We are, <coughs> Dam Kakao is a result of the two major IT company in uh, Korea. One is Dam and one is Kakao. Like bottom of this, Kakao is very, very popular mobile messenger in global scale, but no one is using that, right? <laughs> well, <clears throat> anyway, Kakao has one, 170 million users right now, and the DAOM is number two Korea's searching and poorer, poorer companies. So, mergers of two, those two companies result in number one in terms of stock prices in you know, Korea. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Most of the time, we, when we running out of resources like CPU and memories and disk, we just add a new, new resources to our existing one. Like system team prepares some servers using NKS, which is our bare metal provisioners, and they provision server to to our team or some other develop, develop, development. Uh, system team using the trying to using the CMDB API. As, as much as possible, so you can interact with the API. And after the server is ready, the network teams set up the switches and routers and VLANs to working with the networks. After that, with our team and my team using the Chef server and Knife, the provision, the OpenStack controllers, and OpenStack, the compute node. It's kind of easy, right? Uh, after the two companies merged, the VM, I just showed the graph about the rate of deleting and creating VMs. The interesting thing is that when you start the service from 2013, the VM delete rate is really high, right? Because at that time, we didn't buy officially for the VM service, I mean, the new hardware for our OpenStack service. We just using the existing one. So we running out the VM, we request the users and developers to delete unused VMs, please. So at that time, they delete the VM. <laughs> you know, developers sometimes just creating the VM, just check the OpenStack API is working or not. So at that time, the deletion is really high. But right after we stabilized our service, the VM creation rate is getting high, like this. So the depletion, the depletion rate is also getting accelerated too. Well, I changed that number into more tangible value, which is prices. We call it crane because in our service, the service name is crane. So we using the, some sense of the expenses to our developer or inside our team. And the crane itself, which is equivalent to the Korean won and which is equivalent to $0.1 dollars. And Right, right now, we are using $40,000 per month when it, when it, according to the AWS Institute pricing table. In, but it doesn't encount, encounter the network and disk uses at all. Anyway, the expenses is getting high like this. Right? Uh, the interesting thing is that the black one is M1 medium, which is only have two gigs memory. And First of service, uh, developer trying to make the small VMs just for the testing. But after we stabilized our service, developers and users trying to create more large VM like in this graph, the VM large, which have four gigs memory and eight CPU cores. <coughs> I'm sorry. Well, I think it's just related with the human nature which, have, which want to have some more powerful VM. And Excel is getting 
growth is getting accelerated after two major companies merges because the number of engineers is getting increased. And uh, then number of developers trying to make new service and new pilot services and project to prepare for the future service and, and other ideas. Uh, this list, uh, resource depletion speed is getting accelerated and this simply make more jobs to managing the resource management, managing the resource like system team and network teams. So system teams should prepare and <coughs> plan more about the, how they deploy or how they prepare the server to the developers, include our, our teams. And network teams also thinking about the networks to getting work, like VLANs and routers and some They have more time to planning and deploying their things to our impress and, and also our teams. But in terms, in terms of our teams working, it's not that getting high, just like the graph here. You know, the network teams and system teams workload is getting orange. We are just white because we only test. We have already tested the recipe for the servers. So whenever the impra is ready, we just click down the light something something something. Then then something is comes up for our services. So in our in terms of the road, we didn't have any challenges at that time. But right after we're thinking about more data centers in a global levels, not in cloud, not, not in a only Korean, like using some services in China, some service in a America, and sometimes we're using we set up network pops to get the to get the <coughs> traffic from the outside of outside of the global. So when you're thinking about the setting up the new data center is kind of nightmare, right? So system teams and network teams and even our teams should interact, yeah, interact, interact so deeply. We're talking a lot and we made a lot of discussion and we made a lot of meetings to make those things. So, uh, and this thing only not only includes the physical data center, physical data, physical and network, it includes the cloud, public cloud provider like AWS and Google and Workspace too. And nowadays, the, the new type of resource isolate, isolation, we call it container, right? We should prepare the container itself. So the, those things getting complicated too. Well, the lessons we from experience, we, we experience from the rapid growth, it's like this. What the thing is that growth doesn't come alone, which means, yeah, infra, in terms of infra, the growth inc includes scale up and scale out at the same time. Scale up can define like this. Well, if you have existing servers and storage, you, you can just add more servers and more storage to the existing one. We call it, we can call it some kind of scale up in an infra level. Right, <clears throat> and sometimes uh, prepare more power to the, our resources. And this thing is not that difficult because when we scale up the racks or scale up the servers, we know when to do, and we can prepare and we can plan in something to our uh, scale up environment. So, but I don't think it's easy, but it's not that hard when you compare to the scale up situation like this like the, set up the new data centers and set up the new aware, availability zones from everywhere is a really hard job. So this leads radical changes of everything, like the way of preparing and the, the way of provisioning and the way of monitoring, the way of logging and the way, the way of logging, developing itself. <clears throat> For example, we are using uh, Splunk for our st central logging system, but when when we're thinking about the volume and we we should thinking about the price, right? So we translate that code into the open source based one, like what's that? The Elastic, Elastic Searchy, and other the Kafka things. We integrate them to them into the more sophisticated way of logging and monitoring and developing system. And when you're thinking about the container itself, container doesn't have the <coughs> syslog type of 
logging system, right? So we, we need to have really big and scale, scale, up, scale out possible way of logging system. And for the OpenStack, we learned something too. And the thing is that resources for the OpenStack VM is come to exist finally. CPU, memory, storage is always experiencing shortages. And the thing is that they have some skewness, like this part and this, this zone, sometimes CPU, CPU is gone first, and this zone is data storage first. So uh, to make it even, the every resource could be candidate for the rebalancing. Like you can move to another zone or another availability system or racks. And even cl client's VM could be moved from or inter interacts. And the second thing is that IP is also resources. Everyone understand and know that IP is resources, right? But when you're thinking about the t in terms of robot scheduling, right now the IP is not a resources, right? Even though uh, from killer version or the, the later, uh, neutron thinking about the scheduling over the IPs, but at, at this moment, we don't have it, have it at all. So, <coughs> but uh, after we experiencing some uh, rapid growth, we understand that IP is very limited than our expectations. Like, it has limited number of IPs, right? So when you set up the subnet, like slash 32 or slash 25, then you limited number. You have limited number of IP available, right? So when when we making up the resources in terms of IP, you should prepare more network or you should prepare more subnet and gateways and hours too. And the thing is that the second thing is that location of, of IP is also restricted by the physical location of the routers and the subnets, right? So when you create some IP inside of some net, you cannot move that IP to another zone or another rack because it using the <coughs> using different subnet or di different gateways. So <coughs> I'm sorry. That that's uh, make it different, like managing those kind of IPs through the racks or through the availability zones, making it tougher for us. Okay, let's go to the neutral networks. Well, we've been using providing network. So in terms of network, we don't have any problem because our network team prepared for us the neutron networks, right? Right now, we are using ML2 plugin. We are starting uh, the beta service from Grizzly, and we upgrade to now Juno, and we preparing for the upgrade to the Kilo. Uh, but changing to the ML2 plugin is not that easy because at the time, they don't thinking about the abstraction of layer two level, so they have, don't have the tables for that. Even though Neutron give us some script to up, update the database, sometimes it's not working, sometimes it works. But nowadays it's kind of good, really matured, so you, can, you don't have any problem with upgrading from some versions to, to another version. Uh, and now we are using Linux Bridge uh, the reason why we moved move from OVS to Linux Bridge is not because stability and not because performance. Because OVS these days, you don't have any <coughs> disagree about OVS is really not good or, or OVS is not that, OVS performance is not good because it's really getting improved day by day. So these days, OVS, OVS is, is stability and the performance is it's, it's not that bad. <laughs> Actually, it's really good. But the reason why we moved to Linux Bridge is the only pure, the operational overhead. When we restarting or reprovising our shape code to our compute node, it restarts the Linux Bridge agent, no, no, Linux, Linux OVS agent. But the thing is that when start the, the Linux OVS agent, it deletes the existing one and fet fetches from new, which is not actually new, data flows for the data plane from the Neutron API. So it makes some dis disconnection like two or maybe three seconds. But most of the time it doesn't matter, right? But 
inside, inside of our, our company, we had an in-house MySQL HA solution, we call it MHA. It's really sensitive to the network. So sometimes it's that disconnection cause stones and <laughs> that the yeah, spray brain symptoms. So the user's database can work work on that. So we moved to the Linux bridge because it doesn't delete the VLANs and other things on the bridge at all. So right after the network, network team's plan and set up the network VLAN and some net gateways, we make our we mapping the availability zones and neutron networks to the physical networks, which is really easy for us. <coughs> uh, after we learning multiple availability zones, we experiencing resource imbalances through the zones. Naturally, at that time, at the first of the service, we permit the uh, developer can select the zones. So, if things like this, if you some developer selects John 1, which just don't have any IP, it gets the error. And then he selects the second one, second John, which don't have the CPU resources, and gets, I, gets error too. And John 3, actually he don't have any resources. Yeah, it has the error message too. Uh, so uh, at the start of the service, we're thinking choosing the develop, uh, aware of the Jones to the developer is not that Bad, but after time goes by, we, can, we hear a lot of complaints from the developer because he cannot prepare the VM to certain zones. Uh, so this time, the filtering scheduling is one helpful because it doesn't count the IP numbers at all. So even though we have CP, CPU resources in a certain certain zone, the IP is kind of different story. So to make it to make serve sort of this one. Migration of VM is kind of solution to that. But the thing is that when you migrate or move the VM uh, from like John 1 to from John 1 and to the John 2, then the IP should changes, right? But the, it causes a lot of complaints from the developer itself because he changes, it changes its IP. So yeah, to cure the resource imbalance, we developed some network counter filter, which is checking the remaining IP over uh, zones. And at, that at this time, uh, developer cannot select the, their, their ability zones, only it's coming from the scheduler algorithm. And select the zone, and the alg that algorithm select the zone which has more IP count. Like this. <coughs> we always checking the IP available and IP users and the CPU count and the memory count available for our services. Yeah, we're thinking it can solve the problem, but we experienced more harder issue because we serve more, more than two VLAN on the same internet device like this. After start, just start of the services, we, we just set the some VLANs on that. Uh, in our company, we have simple rules like one internet and one VLAN when some, one, some net on that, right? It's quite simple, but right after we imposing the scheduler on, the, on, the, on our system, that two teams and our, and our teams too, thinking about and caring about the zones of every compute servers. Two is kind of okay, but when, when we, Operating this like more than eight John is kind of really hard job because it's not continuous to happen. It sometimes happen, and that tells him care about the the port, what's that the port to trunking. And in our side, we should thinking about the VLANs on that. So it causes a lot of problem. Sometimes the trunking is not set correctly, so we cannot provide the network for the VM. And the thing is that still the migration of VM through the zone is not, with the IP on change is not possible anyway. Well, let me think about, and we need, need to think about network connect, connectivity. When you set up the IPv4 network, the ARP protocol set up the ARP table in, in your 
compute or in your switches, like which, which IP has which MAC address. So when application uh, go to the same sub subnet servers and it using the MAC address directly, not using the IP address. But when the client uh, reach, reach out to the different subnet, it attaches the MAC address of it and it send it to the broadcast term terminal, terminal, right? Which we call it gateway or routers. And the routers taking care of the packet and send it to the next stop. And the next stop, routers taking the packet and taking care of that, the, the list of the packet. So we send it to the destination. Uh, these days, well, with people using the overlay network, so it gives the applications and it gives uh, VMs some kind of fascination, they are on the same network, on the same broadcast network. Even though they are physically and geographically separated, they, the tunneling, tunneling technology stitching can, can stitching them to give an image, imagination we are on the same sub net. But the thing is that <coughs> even though we can solve the connectivity problem, we're still thinking about such some net, right? Who has the gateways? Who has the broadcast? So we should think about remote version 2.0. And we need to think about those requirements. IP can move through the rack and through the zone. So when we experience the resource imbalances, it can be solved by migration without change the IP. And uh, if we if we develop or set up new system for the network, it should have fault resilience. Like some switches or some system is gone, still the network is working. <coughs> and and first thing is that it should check the dynamic status of the network. So some port is gone or some VM is created, it should informed by event or IPC connection, it should have that. And the more important thing is is that for us is a simple resource IP resource planning and management. Every time we need we set up the VLAN, I mean the a very job, we set up the VLANs and set up the gateway and set up the routers, which is not good for us. Because the rapid speed is really acceler accelerated every time. <coughs> so we're thinking router is kind of really good candidate because when we're using the dynamic routing protocols through the routers, you can Dynamic, dynamically detect the situation and changes of your network. And router is really high distributed, right? There's no central controller about the, net, about the routing network because they can exchange their information through the routers using the dynamic routing protocol. And you have HA, like you can link the two routers at the same time. So one router is gone, the second router can handle that traffic instead of the old one. <clears throat> and the issue is that most of the time we are doing uh, routing information in a ranges like subnet. So the thing is that when we're thinking about we minimize the subnet to certain level, then we can move like in a subnet only IP is one, then we're thinking about we can move that IP using the routing network. So we come to route only IP, which have 32 bit network. Generally using or described like this, slash 32 or full mast network address. Because of it doesn't have any subnet, you don't have to think about L2 networks anymore, right? No, no L2, so no gateway, no subnet, and no other links information needed anymore. Oh, when you, and when, you when you're using the dynamic routing protocol, the IP itself can move anywhere because it when it moved, it advocates its location by through the dynamic routing protocol, right? So now we can make the simple IP planning, like just using subnet as a ranges, right? <coughs> so, and it's very atomic resources, so it can keep its IP when it migrates through the zone. How set it up? We set up in a computer node, just like we provided the other types of networks in an open stack. Like 
we installed over compute, over neutron news bridge agent, neutron DHCP agent in every compute node. And we create neutron desktop like that. We, even though we define some that it's not for the gateway or something like that, we're just using this as just ranges to our resource, resource planning. And then the DHCP server, DHCP, no, no, DHCP, DHCP agent create the DHCP server with some certain IP, yeah, just like that. And user create the VM, and Nova create the VM, and make the tech device to that, and requesting controller to make networks for the VM, and then the Neutron API controller command to make a command to Neutron Bridge Agent and Neutron DHS Agent, like this. So Neutron Linux Bridge Agent create the Linux Bridge for the VM, and Neutron DHS, DHCP agent <coughs> create the desktop for the VM. And, then, and this time, we changed the Neutron DHCP, DHCP agent a little bit, which, have, which only have 32 bit subnet. And it gets, no, it gets IP to the VM. And unt up, up until now, it's really similar with the Neutron local mode network, right? So VMs, VMs inside of it, I mean, the, the package inside of it can communicate through the bridges, but it cannot come out to somewhere else. So to make it work, we installed the Linux router on that and make a Linux router information to the outside world. If you go to the, if you want to go to the, this VM, just make it, just go to the, this gateway. And we make the default gateway of this, this system as a Ethernet 1. So the packet is coming through the Ethernet 1. And the only problem is that when the packet is coming back, it doesn't know it can receive, it can arrive here, but it don't have any information to go there. So we make the host route to this, to this gateway. And this information through the dynamic routing protocol is advocate to upper routers, which is top of rack switches by the dynamic routing protocol. So it's getting done. So it gets information about the VM's routing information. Well, the phase one is that I use the RIP and OSPF for the RIP, RIP for the compute node and OSPF for the top of rack switches. Uh, the reason why I picked the RIP is that it's kind of, it's really light process. And you do know that RIP has some problem with the tracking down the next hop, right? Like 13 or 15, but it's kind of really light processing. So to save the computing resources in here, I first time choose the RIP for that. Uh, after a time, of, after a little while, we've, we're feeling that uh, heterogeneous setting to the compute node and the switches is kind of burden to everyone. So we need to simplify those protocols to something, some standard. And the most important the drawback of this design is that we make uh, Ethernet one as a default gateway. So in terms of installing uh, packages in a compute node, this also follow the Ethernet one. Actually, it's not a big problem, but when, when you're thinking about the service network quality, it's not that good, right? And the most significant drawback is that you can see the management IP from the VM when you're running NC like tools. So you can see the computer node IPs and you can see the open computer node port, network port. So it's kind of possible yeah, security hole. So we divided this using the namespaces. So we, de we define the switch namespace just like the logical and software switches spaces for the VM network. So inside of it, you cannot see the, the hypervisors networks e at all. And inside of these global namespaces, you cannot see the VM's networks either. So it's, sep it's completely separated. And the, for the simplified, the, Simplifying the dynamic 
the routing protocol we use in the BGP for the VMs and for the top of REC switches too. Yeah, we're thinking about phase three too, like uh, setting the same ACE number and same peering IP for the for the this rack. So when you prepare new or prepare new rack or new compute node, like this. So you cannot use you can using the same peering IP for the BGP and same same ACE number for the BGP configurations. The only drawback is that it's because using it's coming from because using the same peering IPs in, inside of rack, you cannot ping from here to the peering IP. But if you make if you make some new kind of managing software, like if you want to ping to this type of this this rack, you can go into the this type of switches and ping. Yeah, we actually doing that. And and getting more extreme is like when we're thinking about uh, using Adapt or adapting tunneling, <coughs> peering, tunneling algorithm to the peering process, you can use the public cloud without changing anything. So we actually testing for that. Yeah, how we serve is that it's really simple. When user create a VM here, it advocate advertise its IP to the router one, and the router one advertising its IP to the TOR, and T TOR gets the information, something like this. This IP is coming from the RT1, and the backbone switches get the routing information too. And because of we rebalancing or have some problem with the, that compute node, we move, if we move the IP, I mean the VM, then the routing information is updated like this. So this time, this IP is coming from the TOR too, right? It's happening dynamic, happened in a dynamic way. You don't have to check every process of migrations. So what is service that simple IP planning, like only IP ranges matter, no more VLANs and no more subnet, no more router planning at all. And because IP can move free through the racks or inside of DC, the resource, resource imbalancing of IP itself is, there's no chance like that. And for the resili resilience, like one servo, I mean, no. one network is gone, the other to take the, that role and it propag propagate through the diamond routing protocol. <coughs> Sorry. And it has this distributed net nature, so Deciding the routing path is very dis distributed through the dynamic routing protocol, so no single point of failure at all. So it's very scaled out. And what we still have to solve is that applying this to the physical server too. We actually this testing this kind of network environment to the hypervisor only these days, but we're thinking about applying this to the physical servers. And the router setting 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 up by API is a little bit yeah, because we are now using only shared script to update the, our sw switches. We're trying to set up the API and trying to using the seed VGP, so IP routing policy can be advertised through the routing protocol itself. And the third one is ACA propagation using the API, like using the flow spec, some, some kind of a standard for that. So ACA information can be propagate through the routers without any human intervention. And the last thing is that even though we can move IP everywhere inside of the rack, we can still have the problem with the VM image itself. We didn't actually using the shared, shared storage right now. So we, we're planning set up the stor st shared storage for that. Yeah, that's it. I'm a little bit so fast because I prepared so much. <laughs> I'm sorry. So here's here's Q and A. We have five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to have, if you if you have some questions, using the mic over there. But the, it's for the recording. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I can hear you clearly. <laughs> yeah. 
do you do you have multiple top of, top of the rack switches or you only have one uh for the open step we have only one okay yeah, so you do you have some level of single point of failures that you're kind of counting on mm, yeah kind okay. of you need to yeah. account for okay got it right and well, also we're thinking about using the multiple tor switches for that okay. yeah and how how large does your routing table get i mean do you talk in the routing tables because you're talking a lot of routes to be updated routes to be mapped because each IP is a route for you practically. Yeah, right. How how big is your routing table going to get get? Uh, you're asking me about the routing table size, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, on the on the switches and the route routers. Uh, about the road because right now actually the network team is taking over the road itself. Only thing I can mention about it, the IP routing table itself. Well, we're thinking about more than. How big is that? More than 10, 10 I don't know, yeah, 1,000 routing tables on the TOR switches. And maybe the backbone switches can handle up to the 100,000 routing tables. Yeah, so it's the, it doesn't matter to us, actually. Hey, so related question there. You marked in your phase three that you're going to use using IBGP as opposed to the OSPF that you already had. Um, have you found have you found the IBGP handling equal cost multi path that OSPF handles much better, particularly with multiple 10 gig links? Uh, the thing is that I actually what's that suggest the, using the OSPF instead of BGP. But the thing is that network team is using BGP for that right now. So actually, we didn't care. Of, I didn't care about the routing right now. So network team select that. Yeah, I'm already running uh, a similar setup with fi about 500, 500 routes, but entirely via OSPF. Uh -huh. uh, and we st explicitly stuck with OSPF because we successfully got equal cost multi-path routing with multiple 10, 10 gig routes between uh, a pair of top of rack switches, um, and we found that performance necessary. And we're concerned that if we switch that to IBGP, that we're going to lose that performance. Uh, really, maybe we, we should inform that information to our network team too. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for the information. <laughs> and yeah. So I saw that you use flow spec, right? Yeah, yeah. Can you elaborate, uh, elaborate a little bit more? How do you use it? Why? Uh, I just pick up the flow spec as an example for the propagating ACL. We're actually thinking about writing some code to the very to the variation of switches. But uh, when we using the when you using the Juniper switches for that, then flow space kind of best selection. But for for us, like we using heterogeneous switches for inside our infrastructures, it's not a good selection. Yeah. Thank you. All questions done or? Yeah, maybe, maybe last one. Yeah. I have yeah. quick two questions. So what network gears do you use? Network gears, which vendor do you use? Uh, for the top, uh, tier, top of rack switches, we're using maybe Cisco. Yeah, I cannot remember it. Why is that? <laughs> Maybe maybe we're using Cisco, right? Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And the next question is, you mentioned you use Plunk, uh, yeah. and you're planning to change to some in-house tool. Yeah. Uh, I, I didn't understand. I didn't get the name of the tools you're using uh, instead of Plunk. This is very generic tools, Elastic Search. Last, okay. Yeah. And uh, the Splunk tool today works with your OpenStack setup because Splunk originally was not meant for that, but does it work with your STN and this kind of uh, L3-based network that uh, you have, does it work with that? No, it's just only related with the rogging itself, okay. not, not with the SDN okay. itself. And one more thing is that this is the, our performance graph through the, our 32 bit networks. It gives more than, it using 10 gig interface and it gives more than 7.5 gigabps. Yeah, so it's not that bad, right? when we're using the OSPF. <laughs> okay, thank you.